the Tufts undergrad arts and School of Arts and Sciences, uh, studying biology and education on the pre-vet track. Um, I'm also on the executive board of the Tufts Pre-Veterinary Society, which is a co-sponsor of today's lunch talk, along with the political science department. As a pre-vet student who cares deeply about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm particularly excited to welcome you to um, today's lunch conversation called From Vet Care to race, equity, and pet perception. This is Tish College's second civic life lunch of the semester, and it continues their fall theme of hidden histories and stories. Today's presentation will delve into the hidden history of pet ownership in the US and how it's related to housing policy and discrimination, racism, and other societal factors. Thank you to the political science department and my friends at the Pre-Vet Society for supporting this event. There are lots of great events coming up this, this, this semester that I encourage you to take advantage of. You can find some of them listed on the whiteboard over there um, at tishcollege.tufts.edu slash events. Um, I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Erin King. Erin is the Civic Life Coordinator at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, where she works to promote civic life and community engagement on the Grafton campus. After earning her bachelor's degree in sociology and anthropology, Erin worked as a community specialist and assistant director of fund development for the Humane Society of Summit County in Ohio. In 2015, she moved to Massachusetts and earned her Master of Science from Tufts University, focusing her work on the link between animal cruelty and other forms of domestic abuse. In addition to her role as a civic life coordinator, Erin is also a fourth year PhD candidate at the Cummings School, specializing in human animal interaction with a particular interest in equitable veterinary care, community health, and the human animal body. Much of Erin's research and analysis is supported by the Tufts Initiative for Human Animal Interaction, which for students in the room who are interested in these issues, I highly recommend learning more about their work and programming. Um, I'm currently uh, a research assistant for the Pets and Wellbeing Lab um, with Dr. Betty Miller, um, affiliated with the Initiative for Human and Animal Interaction. Um, for undergrads thinking about what courses they will take next semester, I recommend Professor Miller's spring class called Human Animal Interaction in Childhood and Adolescence. That's how I got involved in her lab. So please welcome Erin King. Hi everyone, I hope lunch is delicious. Um, thanks for coming today and thanks um, Tish and Jess for having me. Um, I'm just really excited to highlight some of the work that we're doing at the Grafton campus um, and really thinking about how do pets and pet ownership, how do we fit, how does that fit into Tish College mission, but also thinking about a multiracial democracy and civic life. Um, so that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, and I really liked the theme of these talks throughout the semester about hidden stories. What are the hidden stories that aren't talked about a lot when we talk about race, equity, and injustice? And one of those aspects is pets. Um, so thinking about how pets are impacted by societal inequities in a multiracial democracy. Um, and today we could talk about this for hours and hours, um, but we're gonna kind of get a crash course into some of the main topics about um, access to veterinary care, housing, and perceptions. So I'm gonna try to cram as much as I can into the next 35, 45 minutes, um, but please feel free to stop me and ask questions. You can talk after, and then my contact info is on the last slide if you wanna talk more about this. So um, I just briefly wanna talk about um, and recognize that my own identity in this conversation as a cis white woman talking about I have race and identity. Um, and that it's really important to, um, when consuming research and information, to, to think about identity and how it plays a part in this conversation and role. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time acknowledging that at the beginning. So in terms of companional relationships and what we think about pet ownership, and specifically in the United States context, um, we know that pets are very common um, that are in all sociodemographic levels, and that income is not a very strong predictor of pet ownership. Um, about 57 to 70% of homes in the United States have pets. Um, and within that, about 94% of those households consider pets to be a big part of the family. Um, 
they can have a lot of direct assistance to owners. There's been a lot of research on the benefits of pet ownership, um, while a lot of that's somewhat contested. Um, there's evidence of positive health outcomes associated with pets, um, things like cardiovascular health, mental health. A lot of research is focused on stress and social isolation, things like that. Um, and pets can also provide people with emotional support, emotional comfort, and have feelings of less isolation and loneliness. So there's a lot of potential benefits to pet ownerships. Um, and in addition to the individual relationship benefits, pets can also function as a catalyst for other social interactions. A lot of times when you see a pet, you get really excited and you want to go up to the pet and talk to them, but then you also have this connection with the owner um, and they can serve as an ice breaking and facilitate social conversation and a lot of social cohesion and potentially community cohesion as well. Um, when someone has a pet, there's also been research done on that person is seen as more trustworthy um, and there speaks to their overall impact of being a non-judgmental social support resource. Um, so there's a lot of different ways in which pets impact us and how the human animal bond really makes a difference in our lives and the community around us. That being said, there's a lot of barriers to pet ownership, and we think about is pet ownership equitable across the United States. Um, some of those barriers to pet ownership that we can focus on is cost. Um, owning pets can be really expensive, especially thinking about veterinary care. Um, a lot of times in veterinary care, just like in human medicine, how there's specialties like um, cardiology, ophthalmology, radiology, all of those specialties that exist in human medicine also exist in veterinary medicine. But the problem is that in, medicine, in the human side, we have insurance to cover a lot of the costs of some of these specialties and the expenses of medical care. Unfortunately, on the veterinary side of things, there's a lot less options for insurance. Insurance can be really expensive. So then those costs get put directly on the consumer and the different models of veterinary care have not um, progressed along with the change in how we think about medical care and insurance over time. Um, there's other barriers to care like health literacy, knowledge of pet ownership um, or not pet care, um, time, uh, if you have to go home to let your pet out or you want to spend more time at home because your pet is there, um, the care burden itself, it can be really overwhelming and add stress to your life if you're having behavior problems or things that are um, uh, cause conflict in the home because of your pet. In addition, there's things about housing, which we'll talk about more, and then transportation. If you don't have a car and you need to go somewhere with your pet and you can't take your normal means of public transportation, maybe because they don't allow a pet or you have to go somewhere far for veterinary care and you can't get there. So there's a lot of barriers to pet ownership that is impacted by equity issues um, for different determinants of health that we'll talk about in a moment. But it brings up the question of, because pets are so expensive, um, you know, are pets something that should be accessible to everyone? And a lot of that question you hear sometimes in veterinary medicine, like, oh, if they, if they don't, I can't afford a pet, they shouldn't have one. But the idea of pets are really beneficial. So why should that be a luxury for only certain portion of the population to be able to enjoy or have in their home? So what really we need to think about is the systems around pet ownership that are impacting that relationship. So or can we fix the systems around to make pet ownership more equitable? Therefore, those benefits are available to more people. So that's sort of the basis and foundation for, the, for where we're coming from today. So if we think about pets and how they fit into the family, the context of the community and the larger society as a whole, as we're thinking about democracy, we want to, this is monkey, by the way, this is one of my foster babies I had as a kitten. Um, so it's a real life picture. Um, so the pet itself really exists within a different a system, right? Pets are always connected to a human. Usually that's what makes them a pet is that they have a human or family attached with them. So when we say that, the pet itself is impacted not only by the owner that has direct relationship with them, but also the family around them, which is connected to the community resources that impact the family, owner, and pet it's themselves. So when thinking about what resources are available, all of these structural inequalities and social determinants of health that impact the owner, the community, and the family ultimately also impact monkey, right? Because monkey is a part of this system. And when we think about some of these historical power dynamics, a lot of times we think about it from a really anthropocentric view, right? The human-centered view. Um, but there are other species that are involved into our communities. And we need to think about how these structural barriers set up by our democracy impact monkey and other pets around them. 
And today we're gonna to think about that in one specific issue, thinking about access to care and access to veterinary care. Um, we could talk for days on access to veterinary care, but we're gonna fly through um, real quick and give you a kind of a snapshot overview of some of the problems in access to veterinary care and how that's impacted, um, how pets are impacted, but also the owners themselves. So this is a big slide, but um, in thinking about veterinary medicine, there's a significant problem with um, who our veterinary vets are. Um, in 2018, the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, found that about 93% of veterinarians practicing in the United States are identified as white. And if you see here, this is from the 2013 data, veterinarians are actually the number one um, uh, least diverse profession in the United States. And that went from 97% in 2013 to about the 93% in 2018. Um, and if you notice, veterinarians are the top and other, no other doctors like dentists, health professionals are even on this list. It's a very veterinarian specific problem. Um, and that has lasting implications because it is such a least, because it is a field that does not have diversity. We see that there, it could lead to resource deserts and care deserts in communities where there are not minority doctors present or practicing. Um, we find that in human medicine, that minority healthcare professionals are more likely than not minorities to serve in underserved communities. Um, therefore, to increase access to care, we definitely need to look at this um, further in a depth of why this profession is so, um, uh, is so undiverse. Um, in thinking about how that impacts veterinary care today, historically, if we think about what veterinary care and where they came from, it was mostly in affluent communities that could pay for services. Therefore, when we think about um, this map was looking at poverty rates and location of veterinary clinics. Um, if you look at these red areas here where there's the most poverty rates, you can see there's almost no veterinary services in these areas. And where there's the most veterinary services is the least amount of poverty, right? So if you own a pet and you live in these districts here, um, you're not gonna have access to a veterinarian. And if you do, you have to travel. Do you have access to transportation becomes another issue. Does public transportation allow the pet with you to go to the next, uh, to the dentist, um, to the healthcare other professionals and a veterinarian, right? Can we add veterinarians to those lists of healthcare professionals that you need to see? Um, so there's different ways in which redlining and historic redlining of these districts um, and housing districts have impacted pets. And it's something that we need to talk about because it's not something that you hear about often is the um, access to care issues surrounded by pets. And with that, because there aren't access to veterinarians in a lot of places, animal welfare organizations have also sometimes developed negative bias against people that don't have access to care. Um, and that's interlaid with um, negative opinions um, because of someone's perceived economic status, their race, misconceptions of stereotypes of being cruel towards animals. Um, so this is a nice quote from Amanda Arrington, who works in Pets for Life, um, that too often these opinions exist without much understanding of the impact of poverty and systemic bias, which frequently isolate certain demographic populations and diminish or completely remove options and choices when it comes to pet care. So... One of the things that they decided to do at Pets for Life was look at data from their program and replace some of this stereotype bias um, with actual data. And this scenario looks at spay and neuter decisions, which is a really common thing people used to say was that um, spay and neuter decisions were um, determined only by cultural significance and that certain races were less likely or more likely to spay and neuter. Um, and there was really no data behind that. And you can see it in the early literature in vet med that was cited over and over again. Um, but when you look at other context clues around spay and neuter, a lot more comes to light. So they looked at their populations that this program at Starlight works in, and it was over almost 40 different communities um, and a lot of animals, almost 83,000 animals. Um, and when they asked 
no, the door to door and asked people if they would like to spay and neuter. And what they found was that when people that did not have access to care were asked if they would spay and neuter, if they could have transportation and the cost paid for, actually most people said yes and race wasn't a predictor of spay and neuter decision. So it wasn't that spay and neuter decisions were um, predictive by race, it was that they were predicted by access. And so when you gave people access to spay and neuter, the rates went way up. So it was one example of how we made the veterinary community made biased generalizations based off race when actually it was issues of access and care. Um, so that was one example that I wanted to highlight. So um, vet access to care really thinks about um, all of these social determinants of health and how they impact not just the human, but also the animal. Um, Economic stability is the, one of the biggest ones we talk about in terms of cost, but there's a lot of others. Thinking about education and health literacy um, is huge. Thinking about community and social context um, is a really big one as well. And I wish we had all time to dive into all of these, but we don't. Um, but I do want to talk next about housing because that's one that is um, really quite, um, quite uh, substantial. Um, but first, <laughs> I want to highlight this research that we've done through Tisch College, as well as the veterinary school and the Tufts research group. Um, so this was trying to get at that question of accessible care and do people have the access to the, that their care that their pet needs. Um, so this was with the Tufts research equity group and um, we surveyed about 12,000 people, 1200 people. And we found that race and ethnicity, education and financial fragility were all significant predictors um, if someone had access to veterinary care. So we found that um, Hispanic or Latinx pet owners had lower scores um, than white participants when controlling for financial indicators and education. So that, that's, that we asked people, do you, can you easily access care in your community? That was our main question. Um, and white pet owners were the highest scores. So they said, yes, we can access it. Um, and Hispanic pet owners um, had the lowest scores of access to care. Um, the other large predictor besides race was financial fragility, um, which was present on all forms of income, which is an interesting finding. Um, basically, we asked people um, how quickly or confident you could come up with $2,000 if an unexpected needs arose. Um, and most people on average said they are only somewhat confident and about 20% of people said they weren't confident at all that they could come up with $2,000. And when you think about pet ownership, if your pet has an emergency, that's really significant if you can pay for that emergency or if you might have to consider relinquishment or euthanasia. So thinking about the equity of financial fragility um, and how that impacts pets is really important. And then finally, we found that participants who utilized government assistance programs had significantly lower ease of access scores. So if you were utilizing a government assistance program like SNAPS with um, food stamps, you were more likely to not be able to access veterinary care. Okay, so housing, let's, we're flying. Okay, so housing inequity is something, another point that we wanted to highlight, um, thinking about how, you know, a multiracial democracy and race impact pets and pet owners. Um, so pet ownership is not a protected status under the Fair Housing Act. So this means that um, there's no federal regulations limiting the number of pet fees or pet rental deposits, security deposits that a landlord can place on you. Um, and we know that there's a housing crisis in the United States, excuse me, um, and about 37 affordable and available units for every 100 uh, extremely low income renters. And housing insecurity is not race neutral. Um, we know that home ownership by race, white Americans are much more likely to own than Latino or African American renters. And that impacts pets because people of color are more likely to be housing insecure and even more two times are likely to rent than uh, white households. And this is directly impacted by pets because pets are another way to restrict who can live in your property. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that more with perceptions. But because there's limited rentals available, pet owners are disproportionately impacted by these inequities um, because they're more likely to rent. So being able to think about housing in a broader way of, of what housing policies are impacting people, pet ownership and pet restrictions are one of those things. This study actually looked at pet fees in Texas um, and they found that 
pet fees were being as a way to restrict and select who would live in their <coughs> different apartments and communities throughout Texas. They found that low income communities and communities of colors were more likely than higher income and predominantly white communities to pay disproportionately higher fees. Um, so basically, this was looking at the pet care burden, so um, how much the pet fees were, and looking at the percentage of people in, of color in the census tract, and basically the more um, diverse community was, the higher the pet fees were. So it's an example of um, uh, pet fees being used as a way to um, discriminate against certain types of pet owners and pets themselves. Um, this study is in... Uh, the, I have the citation at the end too, it's really interesting. Um, and it looks at pet fees as a way to, um, uh, as in, in, in context with the Texas median income um, and a nice way to summarize the disparities in housing and pet ownership. So finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about greed perceptions. Um, so, one of the biggest read perceptions that has been influenced by race and to talk about in this in this context is the pit bull. And um, I say pit bull very loosely as it is not does not describe one breed. It oftentimes means any dog that has a boxy head. Um, and a lot of times dogs that don't even have any pit bull terrier are just looked at and said, oh yeah, that's a pit bull because of the way their face is shaped. Um, but the narrative around pit bulls has really followed um, different storylines throughout time. And what dogs are considered dangerous follows different uh, storylines throughout time. So in the early 20th century, um, pit bulls were actually considered the American dog. Um, and this is one of the pictures from World War I. Um, and this <laughs> was um, one of the posters for World War I. And actually the American dog that was considered the, the, the dog of, um, to be defined by was a pit bull type dog with a big boxy head. Um, and if you can see here, they actually have like, this is like the French bulldog and the Russian dog, the German dog, the English bulldog. It was sort of like the typied breeds per country and this was their sign. Um, and they appeared in different posters for both World War I and World War II. Um, and the first dog to ever actually receive a, med a medal from the army was a pit bull type dog. Um, and they also were featured as um, sort of the nanny dog of America in the early 1900s, thinking about how their affectionate disposition and their toler tolerable tolerance of children around them. If you remember the little rascals dog, um, that was a pit bull type dog. Um, and there are other dangerous breeds of dogs at the time, but it really wasn't centered around the pit bull. But as time goes on, um, that story has sort of changed depending on who is owning these dogs. So if we look at the 1800s, actually the most dangerous dog um, for the time were actually bloodhounds. And that was cited as one of the most dangerous or there are more dog bites than any other breed was bloodhounds. As you move through the 1960s and 70s, German shepherds were considered the most dangerous dog, especially thinking about the civil rights era and the use of weaponization of German shepherds. And then in the 1980s, you have the war on drugs starting. Um, and with the war on drugs and the weaponization of, of the police um, and this narrative, Pitbull's kind of got drug into that narrative as well. Um, and there's a lot of cases of um, the media talking about pit bulls in a way that is um, associating, you know, uh, carriers of contagion of criminality was a couple of the different headlines that they were said. And there was different laws put into place to try to limit the uh, use of pit bulls and different other dangerous breeds in different communities. Um, the Ohio Supreme Court said that they are dangerous because they are found in urban settings. Um, that are crowded living conditions and with lots of children, therefore pit bulls were dangerous. Um, so really this narrative was started to associate pit bulls and crime, pit bulls with blackness and pit bulls with black communities that then were perpetuated this narrative of this dog being dangerous. Now, in 2019, they did a research study actually thinking about, they showed different pictures of breed dogs and who do you think owns this dog? They use German Shepherds, small breeds, pit bull breeds, everything under the sun. And 
pit bulls were perceived as the most commonly belonging to people of color and specifically young black males. And actually they did the same thing for German shepherds that also had that history of being a dangerous dog, but has changed. And now that is potentially because now people see German shepherds to be owned by white families um, and pit bulls, that number was much lower at 34%. Um, of people um, trying to weaponize what pets they own to try to keep them from living in certain areas. Um, and you can see that specifically with breed specific legislation. So BSL is a really, really hot topic and we don't have time to really dive into that today, but basically BSL talks about um, where you cannot, where these types of dogs can and cannot live. Um, specifically pit bull type dogs, sometimes German Shepherds, Akitas, Dobermans, Rottweilers, sort of the list of dangerous dog breeds. Um, but it's not more, they found in uh, the research about BSL that it A, doesn't work, but B, that it's more about the people that own these dogs and a way to keep them from living in certain areas versus about the dogs themselves. So thinking about how pets are impacted by race in a multiracial democracy, we have to look at the context surrounding not only breed, but what policies are being put in place. How do they impact <coughs> all communities and not just white powerful communities? Um, and what are the narratives that go along with that? Um, so this was definitely um, something I wanted to, to highlight. It's really complex, especially when you start thinking about um, research on some of these different breeds and, you know, um, but I wanted to touch on it today so that we can at least another layer of this context of why race matters when thinking about pets. So we'll crash course. <laughs> so what do we do? Um, I just threw a lot of information and it can be really overwhelming when you think about, well, like another thing of, that we need to think about when we think about race and democracy, right? So one of the biggest things and glaring issues, at least in the veterinary field, is how do we increase diversity in animal welfare professionals and veterinary professionals, um, and therefore increasing access to care? And then how do we also address some of the health disparities in veterinary medicine? Thinking about cost, language accessibility, health literacy, um, some of these barriers to receiving veterinary care that are interlaced with um, systemic issues of race. Um, how do you put these all together to then culminate into a more equitable healthcare practice for the human and the animal? Um, we really need to think about healing the relationship between animal welfare organizations and BIPOC communities. Um, there's been a lot of tension throughout the last 30 to 40 years um, and a lot of taking of animals, you know, that has generated a lot of mistrust in different communities. And animal welfare organizations aren't seen as a resource in a lot of communities. They're seen as someone that will come in from the outside and take my animal um, instead of a resource that could potentially help with veterinary care and that sort of thing. Also, we need to really think about our policy decisions and are we thinking about human-animal interaction as a policy and then how is it involved in the democratic process? Thinking about that through a One Health lens. How are we including animals into our One Health perspective for policy? Are we thinking about the environment? And then are we thinking about how the human-animal bond really impacts the family and community context? And then finally, um, to address some of these structural and systemic inequities in this multiracial democracy, it's important to think about the, 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 the people and animals that aren't necessarily <coughs> present with a strong voice. Um, you know, pets aren't going to be able to vote. They're not going to be able to, you know, be holding signs and participate in our democracy. But we can say that the human animal bond bond has a potential to bring people together and that it has a potential to really unite and have cohesion through the community. And with that, we need to have resources that are more equitable for everyone and equitable for pet owners, not just white pet owners, um, and have those conversations about research that aren't just on white participants, which is a huge problem in human animal interaction. So with that, <laughs> Um, that's pretty much all I have. Not much, I know. Um, but I wanted to, um, these are some of the continued readings that I'd suggest. Um, this one was actually the Tufts Equity research paper that we published about financial fragility and race and the accessible care. Um, and then if you're interested in sort of this pitbull narrative of dangerous dog breeds and the history of dangerous dogs, 
um, Ann Linder, who's actually a Tufts um, uh, of Vet School alum. This is a really nice piece that uh, has all the citations um, that I mentioned in there as well. And yeah, let's let's talk. We have about 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. If there's questions, conversation, anything like that. This one are two cats that were also in the shelter, so they love each other. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm really curious about both the, um, the the transition of pets from economically useful to economically less useful. <laughs> um, you know, you might have had a dog to guard something or herd something or things like that. Um, and how, like, how that trajectory is going in the United States and then how it's going differently in other places too. Um, but I'm actually more, a little more perturbed by the fact that it's like children have made the same arc of economically less useful to economically a real, like a real need. Um, and I wonder if it is a, like, is that too much of a parallel? parallel or do you think like, do you think that's a, those things are connected or overly correlated in my brain right now? Okay. Uh, let me, so asking about the um, relationship or parallels between children and animals. Yes. Is that horrible? I don't even know. Yeah. So um, I think it's hard to say. Um, there has been a lot of research in terms of the link between um like animal cruelty, domestic use, and domestic violence, and that um, children and expand and animals that are in the same home often have co-occurrence violence happening. Um, so there's been a lot of work on on that per se. Not I don't know of anything that really draws a lot of parallels between children and and animals, other than like sometimes there's um, attachment theory. Um, that's you know pulled for to, to talk about animals and our attachment styles. Um, but not a ton. I say, I think more to your, com your first comment about, um, sort of the, the trends of pet ownership and how we perceive pets is, and cross-culturally too, is, is really important in that there's not one way to own a pet. And even the term own can be problematic. Um, there's community style pet, pet relationships, there's different ways, and there's not one right way to have a pet in your life. Um, and that I think is something that gets lost a lot, especially thinking cross-culturally. Um, and in the literature, we very much focus on the white suburbia way of owning a pet. Um, and, and that's very, very, very true. Um, and, but I do think that there is some truth to the idea that pet ownership sometimes changes with um, the, the, the hierarchy of needs. There's a really interesting, actually a paper on um, it about Thailand and how toy breed dogs are becoming more popular in areas where there's a high economic development. So there, I do think that there is some cross-cultural um, really interesting things happening for, for pets and where like working animals become companion animals and that line, I, I think it is definitely a spectrum because you can have both, um, but it's a really, really interesting point. And my wife's a vet and so <clears throat> what a, a lot of what you say rings true she says most of the strays are coming from the american south i don't know if it's a cultural thing or a or, or an economic thing what i'm curious about is asians hispanics other migrants that come from other countries that might have different views of pets and whether the same, uh, you have any data on the same sort of ownership patterns because they have different um, socioeconomic stats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I personally have, don't have data. Um, not that, no, nothing really comes, we've done some, there's been some work on if socioeconomic status predicts levels of pet ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, the AVMA just released and um, actually uh, the Denver uh, Pets for Life also did some work on this. And they found that pet ownership rates are relatively stable across all socioeconomic mm -hmm. statuses. Um, 
specifically for immigrants. I'm not exactly sure on that one, but they did find that, um, you know, socioeconomic status wasn't necessarily a predictor of pet ownership. Um, now, how pets are involved in the family could definitely vary, um, but even in some of the cross-cultural work, I think it was in China, there was a paper that was thinking about um, uh, similarly, our pets are part of the family, and that was still the percentage is still very, very high. Um, so I think it's just sort of that question of what context you're looking in. Um, but the South definitely has more animals available in shelter. Transport is a huge hot topic in animal sheltering um, because we are transporting so many animals up from the South. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons that people have for that. Um, but that's a whole nother like can of words that we could get into, but um, it's super interesting. Yeah. I'm interested in knowing more about um, the relationship between pet rent and legislation. Yeah. Like I lived in Virginia before I lived in this state and the pet rent here is ridiculous. Yeah. And like just ridiculous. And I'm wondering, like, is it a New England thing? How does this vary across states? Like, are there examples of people who successfully like had sort of collective action around forcing um, um, property managers to lower pet rent or something? Yeah. Uh, not that I know of, because <laughs> um, there's definitely no federal protections for that. So like they could astronomically charge $500 for a pet fee deposit, and that's just like what they're able to do. Um, there is sometimes the use of animals as um, emotional support animals is protected as a housing policy to a way, um, but that's not through fair housing. Um, but not really, not that I know of. I don't know if you know of any other ones, but. Yeah, really, I mean, this is part of the emotional support animals yeah. are covered under the Fair Housing Act. So yeah. if you have an emotional support animal, they can't charge you a pet fee. So this is, now there's a huge influx of people applying for emotional support animals, which is not necessarily the best way of fixing a bad policy is <laughs> going around with another yeah. policy. Yeah. So I. There's a lot of economic, I think in areas like Boston where the rent is already higher and there's already a lot of housing pressure, the market allows landlords to be able to charge more because people will pay it. Yeah. So, and, and I think that that paper from Texas also looks at the median income levels for the pet care burden. Um, and even when the income levels are the same in different communities, if there was more diverse people, their pet fees were higher, even if the median incomes were the same. So it's just like another layer onto that housing disparity that that adds from pet ownership. Yeah. So two questions in the chat. Um, first is from a Tisch College colleague, Jenna, and she says, I'd like to hear more about work being done by animal welfare organizations and shelters to connect to communities that might historically have the distrust that you mentioned. Um, and then the second question comes from our other colleague, Nance Marks, about um, how did policing play a role in which animals are perceived as bad versus good? Oh, super questions. Um, like a whole nother lecture. But um, so the mistrust, I think, that happens between general animal welfare orgs and especially thinking about um, community medicine. So it used to, in sheltering, there was a lot of um, distrust because of the um, uh, people trying to uh, just not always take, but there was a lot of distrust through that. And the way that orgs and now are trying to sort of change that narrative is realizing that pets um, are oftentimes better off staying in the home and then provided that care that they're needing. So instead of just trying to have someone surrender their pet because they can't afford the veterinary care that they need, what are the shelter organizations and animal welfare organizations doing so that that care is then provided, the pet can stay in the home where it's loved, but just the resources weren't there in the first place. So I think where organizations have really expanded their community medicine practices, you see a lot more mobile clinics, you see a lot more um, subsidized clinics happening, spay neuter clinics happening. Um, Pets for Life is an organization that does a lot of that door-to-door -door resource um, encouragement to try to keep pets in homes where their resources are lacking. Um, so I think that's one way social organizations are trying to rebuild that, that trust. Um, try to um, provide more humane education is definitely one. 
And then, um, can you repeat Nancy's question? I'm sorry. Yeah, she said, did policing play a role in which animals are perceived as bad versus good? Yeah, so that's another tricky question because policing and surrendering of animal cruelty is different everywhere you go. So um, like where I'm from in Ohio, policing of animal cruelty and animal laws is done by humane officers, which is two peace officers that are um, per county that are in charge of handling all um, like cruelty and um, sick and injured strays go to the Humane Society. Versus here, um, where you have an organization that responds multi-statewide um, versus New York City in 2016, they went from having that humane officer model to then flipping to all uniformed officers responding to animal crime. So you have these different models of how police respond to incidents of cruelty. Um, and, and so that complicates the matter even more so because there's not just one standard way of handling a lot of these principles and you have to think about the really the complexities of working with the police in different communities um, and again it comes back to um, the ability to make resources more accessible like what is happening with the pet that needs to be addressed and what resources are needed to make pet ownership more equitable in, in each community yeah um I have a question like for like what veterinarians can do like individually, like what resources they have. Like if someone came into the emergency room and their vet needs immediate, or their pet needs immediate care, but like the owner can't afford it. Like what are you kind of supposed to do? Yeah, that's a hard, hard question. It's a great question. Um, there aren't a ton of options. There are different organizations that try to help with medical coverages. There's different care credit options for people. Unfortunately, a lot of times it is animal surrender, which, um, it, but I do think a lot of organizations are trying to make it, they have programs to be able to try to afford more veterinary care. Um, but I do think it comes down to thinking about the larger model of veterinary practices and what models are financially um, doable and what financially subsidized care looks like in emergencies. It's a whole nother can of worms too, but thinking about changing the models of care that maybe looks at more incremental care and different spectrum of care options to be able to treat that pet. So spectrum of care is a huge topic. Um, it thinking about, so maybe we won't be able to do everything we can for this animal today, but what can you financially afford in this visit so that we can plan in two months and then two months after that. So developing long-term relationships with client is really important. Um, and thinking about like incremental care and that there's no gold standard um, that every doctor and client is going to need a different plan and how veterinarians can develop spectrum of care in general practice um, as well as in specialty. Yeah. yeah. And um, in medicine, there's, you know, loan forgiveness programs for people who commit to um, working for three years in a medically underserved area. Are there any similar, um, you know, uh, incentives for veterinarians so um, this was obviously veterinary tools yeah. very expensive yeah um or is that just something you I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, that one I don't know. Like there could be different programs like but I know like even care credit like it's still on you as an individual but I'm not sure if there's different modes for forgiveness. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I'm curious what these trends look like in non-traditional species like exotic pets. Yeah. Um, I know like MSPCA, they take um, like mice and birds and things like that. So I know probably exotic pets are more of a privilege to own than cats and dogs possibly, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so interestingly, there's like really limited research on small animals. That's definitely a gap in the literature. Most literature in HAI looks at dogs and then secondary is cats and then small animals is like this much. <laughs> um, so that's a huge area. We found that in, um, I think that exotics are harder because they're um, sometimes not as common. So we don't have as much research about it, but it could be that it's you know, they're, they're not seen as, they have just a different role in the family potentially, um, or not, we don't really know because not a lot of people have looked at them. So, yeah. Um, so you talked about the most dangerous breed list. I was kind of curious of how that's curated and if there's any correlation between 
as the breed becomes more popular, there's just more data on their behavior and if that plays a role in it at all. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there, this, this article actually does, the Black Man's Dog, the Social Isolation Context article, does a really good job of looking at some of the data for pet ownership trends and if they're correlated to bite trends, like maybe it was just because bloodhounds were more popular in the early 1800s, or late 1800s, that that's why they are considered more dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. But they found that even, even with taking into account those trends of ownership, there are certain breeds that are, are targeted and it follows trends of um, who owns them. Um, this is the most common denominator um, throughout the time. And then there's also the idea of what's reported in terms of being dangerous, what the media says is dangerous, what... Um, and there's no like set list, right? Like, so um, each apartment complex can decide which breeds they would like to ban or not ban. When you look at breed specific legislation, it varies per whatever state slash county slash town ordinances they decide to put in place. Um, and there's the research on what makes a dog dangerous or not is extremely problematic and has a lot of methodology errors and flaws. Um, and it's just, again, it's like what gets reported and how do you decide what dangerous is, um, is really, really subjective a lot of the time. It's like a chihuahua bite might not get reported as much as a bite by a larger 80 pound dog, you know? So does that mean this dog is more dangerous than a chihuahua bite? <laughs> I know this could be a whole other talk because you've done it as a whole other talk for the men's <laughs> but um, could you talk a little bit about the, about the connection between um, domestic violence and, and, and cruelty and sort of how shelters, both human shelters and uh, pet shelters are trying to address this and... Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So the link um, between animal cruelty, child abuse, elder abuse, and domestic violence is something that is, um, has quite a bit of literature around it. Um, the link really started originally as this thought of connection from if you hurt animals as a child, you kind of graduate to then hurting adults as a human. Um, that was sort of like that narrative of like the, the serial killer narrative of like, um, you know, you start abusing with uh, animals and you graduate to humans. And what we found is that it's more, the link between these things is actually more a thought about generalized deviance and abuse in the home. So we found that, um, when there's co-occurring violence and there's domestic violence, that violence is surrounded in the family context, which involves animals, oftentimes involves children, animals, elder abuse, and domestic abuse. Um, and there's a lot of, info, like not a lot, but there is research on um, when domestic violence occurs, the pets are involved into that cycle. So unfortunately, a lot of times abusers will use pets as points of leverage. So people will fear leaving because of the dangers that their pet might face if they can't take their pet with them and flee the home. Um, about 50 to 75% of women that were surveyed for one of the studies said that they delayed leaving because they didn't want to leave their pet at home because they were worried about the welfare of their animal. Um, so to the second part of your question about what to do about that, there's been a lot of talks about mandated reported and cross reporting. So when you have child abuse happening in a home in a DCF case, does that then cross report to animal organizations that also have pets in that home? Are there co-occurring agency work to address the violence um, from multiple aspects and areas? Um, one other thing is there's organizations that are working on fostering programs in different shelters. Red Rover is one of them that um, incorporates the pet into um, the plan to uh, vacate a domestic violence situation. Because um, the pet is also really could be a point of emotional stability and connection. And that's something that you might need as you're trying to leave that journey or go on that journey. Um, so incorporating the animal into that, as well as the legal aspect and policy aspect of incorporating pets into restraining orders is a big one. Um, in Massachusetts, Martha Grace worked on this and that pets are actually are able to be included on a restraining order. Um, but unfortunately, that's not federal. So then if you go to Connecticut or Rhode Island across state lines, that pet is no longer protected. So thinking about federal policies that can then protect that animal and therefore that family um, is a big big one there too. So there's there's a lot of research on that. And it's really um, the National Link Coalition, if you're interested, that's a really good resource that you can Google for that. Yeah. There's so much. <laughs> Question, how much of um, how much research is there on these themes and topics, but specifically about those like communities that of folks who are experiencing homelessness who have pets? 
So homeless, tra like transient populations, there, there is some work on transient housing populations, especially about like the, um, like the bond relationship. There's one on that. And there's some on, um, uh, there's there's actually it's used a lot as an example of uh, quality of life and like who should own pets. That's a common example is like who has the better quality of life, the dog that's at home for 10 hours when the person's at work or the dog that's constantly with their person that might be in transient housing, but that's with them all the, all the time. Um, and how do you kind of um, that that there is not a way to say who shouldn't ha shouldn't have pets um, because people love their animals and a, a lot of times people will do things for their animals before they do things for themselves um, and that's something that they they found um, like you'll you're more willing to get your animal care before your self care so there's a lot of um, work being done around accessible human health care at the same time as veterinary care. And the point, the pet is often, often an access point to um, address health needs in the humans of those um, that own those pets. Um, so there's like community health clinics where veterinarians, they'll have like a veterinarian, um, the, the street drug project, that's, you know, they do like a veterinarian, um, haircuts, a uh, nurse practitioner and uh, that people will go to that clinic space for One Health because of their animal, because they want their, their animal to be seen. And then that's an access point to then get them to see a dentist and then for the human side of things. Um, Whiskers is a clinic in Wisconsin, the veterinary school where they do something very similar is that they have a nurse practitioner and they have veterinarians working simultaneously to help people in this sort of One Health arena because people are more motivated sometimes to get their pets and put their pets into care. So it's a really good access point that way. Yeah. I have um, some friends who are elementary school teachers and they work at a school that has a dog mm. that students can spend time with from time to time. And I guess I'm wondering if you see um, like access, different models of having access to a pet. Um, and I wonder if that is like more part of a public health conversation and the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking in particular the ways in which people have also talked about loneliness as like a public health issue mm -hmm. in the midst of the pandemic. Yeah, uh, totally. Um, so we did a, um, oh, so many things to say. Uh, so we, uh, there's definitely a conversation about pets and public health for a number of different reasons beyond just zoonotic disease. One of them definitely is loneliness and isolation and those tools, the pet as a source of social support in that way. Um, but then also what you mentioned was like an animal assisted activity, right? So does having an animal in an activity um, with children specifically, does that promote better health outcomes or better learning outcomes, that sort of thing? Um, that's actually sort of the, the Dr. Mueller's lab is looking at pets and well-being in general. And, and we, um, what does the pet do and does there, are there health outcomes in that way? And there's different animal activities, there's animal therapies, there's, um, and there's mixed bags of research on all of it. Um, sometimes, you know, we actually did a study where we didn't really find a difference when the pet was present for a stressful event. Um, but we need more nuance in the research to be able to say, you know, what context does pet, do pets or animals facilitate physiological difference, but as well as structure, like social difference, because there's sort of two, air, two, two spheres in that world. So, so huge. That's like all of human animal interaction research was sort of what you just said. So it's like, <laughs> it's a lot there, but yeah. Thanks everyone. This is so fun. That was so good.